Yeah, so thank you so much, Colin, for the introduction, the lovely introduction there, and also thank you, IPI team, for for hosting this webinar and you know helping us and giving us an opportunity to talk about Transify. Uh, so without further ado, my name is Ashish. I'm actually working with Dr. Reza on Transify. What we are doing is we are creating long-range, safe, and efficient wireless power transfer technology. Now, the aim of this particular presentation is just to give you a quick overview of wireless power network technology and how these applications work within industrial IoT. But overall, what we are doing in Transify is actually just trying to remove cabling infrastructure entirely. Now that wireless communication data is pretty much quite mature, our core focus now is what's left over, which is, uh, which is power. Now, our vision as a company is to provide access to power to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Now, a bit about the agenda. So first, we're going to go through the background of wireless power transfer that comes behind it. Why is it actually useful and, and, and can be commercial application and, and provides ROI? A bit about the team. And then Dr. Reza will dive into the wireless power technology itself uh, and some case studies as well of some of the deployments. And then these are some pretty cool deployments that we've had. I'm super excited to be able to at least uh, showcase that you know, to you all. And hopefully, you have some questions as we move along. So background for wireless power transfer. Well, power is one of the most you know, important discoveries of mankind. But you know, ever since it was discovered, one thing that you know, both of us uh, when we started the company have realized is that cabling infrastructure is still the one remaining thing that has not changed. It is literally holding humanity back in a big way. One seventh of the world's population does not have access to power. Offshore renewables remain economically impossible. And there's new areas which we have been talking about for quite a while now, such as smart nations, industry 4.0. In fact, when I first, uh, in my first job in 2007 in, in National Instruments, we were talking about IoT since then, and it still remains a dream. It's something that we have not been able to scale and, and see the fruition of it yet. Now, the aim of industry 4.0 and smart nations, in the end of the day, it's about automation. For automation to happen, you need autonomous systems which basically requires a digital infrastructure around us, turning this physical space that we see, the walls, the, uh, the counters, the temperature, the environment into a whole digital network. For that to happen, you need mass sensor deployments. You cannot rely on cabling infrastructure to do that. So that needs to be untethered for us to be able to move forward in society and be able to also have a full digital world of autonomy. Now, what we are doing is we are actually solving this issue with wireless power network technology and also optimizing longer lasting systems to be able to run without cabling infrastructure and using pretty much wireless systems. Now, wireless power transfer as a technology, though, has been around for quite a while, especially for radio frequency. It's something that we have basically been doing since you know, 1904 with uh, the Wardenclyffe Tower, Nikola Tesla. He tried to develop, if you don't remember, he tried to develop this system to be able to provide access to power to everyone. He never really launched because he just uh, lost his funding. But essentially, the concept was there. 1975, uh, 34 kilowatts over 1.5 kilometers by NASA. The other one by JAXA to do, uh, they did it 1.8 kilometers over 55 meters in 2015. I mean, these are all tests that were done for high power transmissions. The aim is to actually launch a satellite in space, be able to collect and harvest energy in space and then transfer it to Earth, which theoretically should be a lot more efficient. Uh, these things are still being worked on, actually. China just launched a program to do this. Uh, New Zealand has allowed, for, allowed high power, wireless power transfer by different companies as well. So countries are definitely uh, getting more adopted to wireless power technology, that's for sure. And it's super exciting, to be honest, as a space. And that's why it's actually quite exciting for us to be in here and be a pioneer in some of the technology areas. Now, there are many types of wireless power technology out there. Now, you probably notice things like magnetic and inductive coupling, lasers, and radio frequency as the core areas of uh, wireless power transmission. Now, magnetic and inductive is something that you probably have seen a lot. In fact, your phones right now have the capability of going on top of a, a pad, a charging pad, and be able to charge. In fact, cars, you can go over a pad as well and be able to charge a car. 
Now it's it's a uh, pretty safe and efficient. It transfers a lot of power, but the big problem is distance and also reliability. Uh, for this system itself, the phones heat up quite a bit, so it does uh, get quite dangerous. But also at the same time, you're you're limited to a very short distance of a few centimeters, and that's something which is not super practical when it comes to wireless power. You might as well just plug it in. It's lasers. Now lasers actually solve that short distance issue. It can go quite long distances, which is fantastic. But the technology is still very immature. It is also hazardous to the environment in terms of being able to cross a laser beam is actually quite dangerous. It requires line of sight. Any disruption in transmission, a bit of cloud, a bit of water particles, a small amount of fog will just literally shut the power transmission. Plus also you need accurate focusing. Like any optical systems, whenever you take a picture, you need to focus on the subject to be able to have that ideal transmission. Same thing with lasers. You need to know the exact distance so that you can focus and pinpoint that laser for an accurate power transfer. But the other part also is that it is also a very immature technology in terms of efficiencies, and that's something that might solve down the road, but we're still quite far off from it. Then there's radio frequencies. Now, I'd say radio frequency technology is probably one of the most mature technologies out there in terms of uh, communication. In fact, uh, we have phones right next to us doing pretty much communicating to radio frequency right now. All the components are refined, very low in resistivity and, and really efficient as well to be able to carry out communication and low cost as well. So they're all commodity items, essentially. Now that's ideal when it comes to communication, but when it comes to uh, when it comes to wireless power transfer, there's actually massive efficiency losses when you use radio frequency, and that's something at, what we did at Transify is actually leveraged all the maturity, the commodity items and components of, of of communication, and at the same time solve the whole problem efficiency losses of wireless power transfer. So what our focus is in technology and what Reza, Dr. Reza is going to talk about later on is about how we've you know, really looked into radio frequency as a way forward, being able to not only improve the efficiency, but also improve the whole deployability and commercialization. So one thing that we have not really pointed out much is also the fact that, that radio frequency technology has been around for quite a while, as I mentioned, since 1904. But the big problem is it's never really been commercially viable. And that's something that we have worked a lot on deploying systems out there within multiple companies, tested out for robustness, reliability, and quality. So yes, in terms of maturity, in terms of where we're at in, in the innovation cycle, so I think a lot of you have probably seen this you know, back in school, how you know technology innovate, you know, moves along the innovation cycle. So Wireless power network technology and transfer technology is basically within the early adopter stage. Now for the early, early adopter stage, essentially what we have to establish is robustness, reliability, and high quality power transmission. That is basically what we are against because cabling is super robust and reliable. So wireless power has to be the same or even better in fact. And that's what we have done within the industrial IoT sector. In fact, that's probably the best place to test this. With multiple companies testing our hardware, especially Fortune 500 companies, all being able to actually test and, and give us proof and results that these things are super robust and reliable. In fact, could be even more robust and reliable in cable infrastructure. And the future, obviously, is once this network technology and our core system is robust and reliable enough, it will start focusing onto the mass market, the majority which is where semiconductor strategy will start taking place and allowing for any other technology areas to be able to take on the T5 wireless power network technology. That basically will be the standard for future wireless power transmission down the road. And it can open up a lot of different markets, different applications and different areas because in the end of the day, wireless power or power is ubiquitous. Now, there are companies that are working on wireless power transfer, and they've been actually working for quite a while. A lot of them more than eight years, some less than four years, just about four years or more. What's the big difference about what we've done is actually focus on commercialization. Now, one thing that you notice is that this technology has been around with these companies in terms of chipsets and, and developer kits and circuit boards, 
But no one's been able to really, you know, showcase how these things are commercially deployed and actually used. To being able to power up a, a ARM, ARM Cortex, a Cortex M4, a UV processor, use BLE communication, and also at the same time do applications such as condition monitoring, building monitoring, robustly at, at high data rates, reliably over now more than, you know, more than 18 months of continuous data without any drop signals is tough to do. And that's what Transform has done. We have proven that, and no one else has been able to do that right now. In fact, if you want to find a turnkey solution for you know, IoT and being able to wirelessly power that, you can't find that anywhere else right now. So that's something which I think is, is, is differentiated in what we have done. Um, it's something that I think is super valuable, and that's what Dr. Reza is going to really dive into a bit more in terms of how we've done it in terms of the technology perspective. Now, obviously, to be able to even think about new technology adoption or being able to use new technology, you need to be able to actually justify it by economics. So let's have a look at this chart here. Obviously, this says a lot, where in general, when it comes to cabling systems or, or cabled, in fact, industrial IoT systems, more than 60% of the cost goes into cabling infrastructure which is quite crazy, actually, if you think about it. And we look into some of your deployments out there, start itemizing actually how much cabling costs as opposed to your actual PLCs, your uh, sensors, the program, the software, all that stuff. You'll realize it's actually a huge chunk. Now, battery technology and other technology areas are supposed to kind of disrupt this, this, this huge 62% and allow for scalability of IoT but never really happened. Still 90-94% of industrials are still cabled. Because when you start introducing or removing cables, what happens using wireless, uh, wireless like communication using batteries is that you reduce your data rates. You have extra maintenance cycles because the batteries don't really last that long as well. Some of them last maximum one or two years to be able to match up to the same data rate, same intelligence as a cable system. So being able to scale with that battery aspect and, and reducing your data quality, it's very tough to be able to see ROI. So that's why cabling infrastructure is still kept. But it's really hard to scale. Now at Transify, what we've done is we have actually created IoT platform systems that both are using you know, wireless power network technology, but even our battery-based systems last for a lot longer, allowing for high data rates, high quality analysis, and maintaining the same ROI, allowing for scale. So scalability is really the core aspect when it comes to the future for IoT. And that's where wireless power transfer comes into play in a big way. Now, if you look into the um, OPEX and CAPEX comparison, in a day, what you wanna look into is how cabling and T5 wireless power network and batteries and all these things kind of compare to each other. What do you really notice if you start you know, mapping this out? Like, no, cable infrastructure, yes, the initial capex expenditure is extremely expensive, especially when you're doing scale. I'm talking about 3,000 sensors. The reason why I'm putting this out there is because in the end of the day, we're looking to scale. We're looking to be able to see how we can get to this digital world and be able to be autonomous, right? That's what our goal is. Now, if you can't think about that and be able to extrapolate, then there's almost no point talking about industry 4.0 or autonomy. So that's kind of where, we, you know, what we are pointing out here is that the ability to scale, there's two real options. You can either use cables, which is nice, but it's a really high initial expenditure, but it maintains its actual operational expenditure all the way through. Battery is extremely low in terms of cost initially, but with maintenance and labor, within three years, you actually probably cost the cabling, cabling mark in terms of cost. Whereas the T5 wireless power network, initially, yes, it will cost a bit more than batteries, but it will maintain the same operational expenditure all the way through. Now, at Transify, we have not only improved the battery lifespan, but also at the same time, we have robust wireless power network technology that allows you to pretty much do core systems, high data rate, high data quality for a long term without huge hit in terms of operation expenditure and also the capital expenditure, both aspects. Focus markets are very clear heat mapping, environmental monitoring, condition monitoring. So these are the three areas in which we are focusing on to be able to essentially remove cabling infrastructure 
entirely. Reasons why we chose this is because all these areas require high data quality, require scalability, so mass sensor deployments for protection and for ROI. So this is something that we have worked on quite a bit to be able to showcase how wireless power and also our overall industrial IoT system can actually accommodate for these markets itself. And this is something that we will showcase in our, our case studies as we move along, and you'll see how this actually fits in pretty well. We do do um, um, specific areas which are not within the focus market, such as medical, automotive, and, and consumer electronics, but this is very specific towards uh, customization in NRE. And what that involves, obviously, is you know, it has to be something that you know, does have future orders as well, or future potential. Now, this obviously to, to kind of really end off and then pass it on to, to, to Reza, Dr. Reza, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. In the end of the day, to be able to achieve all this, we've actually had a, have, had a really lean team currently. Um, Dr. Reza and myself, we both co-founders. My background is industrial. I've been, I've been in industry in national instruments for about eight years. Uh, Dr. Reza spent a lot of his postdoc in NUS focusing on wireless power transfer optimization research from near fuel, mid fuel, and far fuel. And you'll talk a bit more about you know, the technologies as well. But the big thing is, you know, obviously bringing on the, the team to be able to commercialize. And Sadata and Lionel have been you know, contributing to be able to actually take us to manufacturing. So that, uh, industrial design from, from Carnegie Mellon University, taking, he's been spending more than 12 years in taking prototypes and designs into manufacturing. Uh, Lionel has been working in manufacturing quite a few years as well. And right now, basically we have a fully manufactured product that is off the shelf and can be bought and pretty much uh, turnkey. What's nice about that in the, in the technology of wireless power transfer, it's very difficult to get there and we've done that. Uh, in a very short amount of time. And that's what we want to be able to express over to you in terms of the technology in that perspective. And then we also brought up Mayank and, and, and younger individuals like Steven as an intern to be able to focus on our embedded development software. So we have that capability of designing from turnkey solution, from, from, from the core PCB level, firmware level, all the way down to an actual turnkey solution. Now, that's pretty much my core of it. Let me uh, pass it on to Dr. Reza to focus on the technology side of things. Hi, this is Reza. Uh, thanks, Ashish, for the introduction and uh, overview. In the next few slides, I will focus on the fundamental of uh, radio frequency enabled wireless power transfer, its application in industrial IoT as well as some case studies. A basic wireless power network includes a pair of tra energy transmitter and receiver. The transmitter has four uh, fundamental components, uh, a signal generator creating the reference RF signal within the permitted frequency band, after which the signal will uh, split between multiple channels. At each channel, we have a phase shifter, uh, which applies the desired time delay on the signal. The phase shifter is the most important component to realize beam forming. Then low powered RF goes through a power amplifier unit to get boots, uh, boosted. The output power is subject to the regulatory and safe, safety measures. Finally, an antenna is used to broadcast and propagate the signal into the air. At the receiver end, we may use one or multiple uh, antennas to harvest the RF and capture the RF from the air. A proper matching is desired to maximize the harvesting. Then we have the RF to DC converter, which performs very similar to the uh, adapters we daily use to charge our laptops and phones. However, the power level we are here talking about the sub milliwatt and the frequency of the operation is in order of the gigahertz. The DC power is stored in a capacitor or a rechargeable battery and is being used to power up MCU to do some routine tasks, including interacting with external peripherals, reading the state of charge of energy storage unit, estimated the received RF power, le uh, power level, and pushing all this data to an efficient wireless communication module, such as BLE, as we are dealing with very limited power budget at the receiver end. The gathered information is sent to the transmitter and is being used to track and control the performance of wireless power transfer. 
Okay, to have a, to realize a practical wireless power network, we need to enhance its efficiency and usability. This is realized through a series of hardware and software features. At the hardware level, we need to have an active beam forming to focus the beam towards the receivers. This will improve the over the air transmission efficiency. We need, we need a hardware which is cable, uh, capable of implementing custom RF signals, which are designed to maximize RF to DC conversion rate at the receiver ends. Rectifiers usually are made of the nonlinear components like the Schottky diodes, and those their performance highly depends on the input power as well as the waveform itself. And finally, we need to use more efficient antennas to maximize the harvesting from the air. On the, on, on the software side, we need an automated mechanism to sense and estimate the surrounding environment and calibrate the RF beams uh, continuously. We need a smart charging mechanism to ensure that, yeah, to ensure that the receiver, receiver can meet their quality of service. We need to make sure that they receive the power on demand. We also need a digital dashboard to summarize the network performance. This is very similar to the Wi-Fi routers portal that uh, nowadays we can log in and see who's connected to the Wi-Fi uh, network and what's the throughput to each of these individual devices. At Transfer5, we use wireless power transfer, uh, transfer technology to develop a truly cable-free industrial IoT solution. Our, solu our solution is plug and play, it's robust, with the real-time data transmission rate. Theoretically, we have the infinite lifespan, super uh, long range of operation up to 25 meters. We are very cost effective and we reduce the installation costs and maintenance by more than 50%. Okay, here I want to compare the, our wireless powered sense module or node versus the battery operated one. For both modules, we have six onboard sensors, including temperature, humidity, air pressure, three axis accelerometer, sound, and, vibe, and air quality. Uh, for the wireless power solution, we, we can transfer up to half a million readings per day. This means to train your AI algorithms, you need to spend just a couple of days rather than several months. For our battery powered uh, unit also, we are limited to the five every five seconds transmission and we can provide up to five year lifespan using two AA batteries. I believe that this is one of the most efficient uh, battery powered sensors in the market. Uh, we also have various range of gateway models to address different um, market section. Our WPN model supplies up to 32 sense modules within the radius of 25 meter. We have the data hub, which is designed for those interested in data uh, wireless data communication only based on the battery technology. We also have the data stick, which is designed to retrofit into the existing gateways. No matter which model you choose, we guarantee that a technician with the basic knowledge in IoT can set up the system within 30 minutes. This means lower, uh, lower uh, installation cost. So far, I had the chance to introduce different hardware solutions for industrial IoT. But what does it really matter to the end user, I believe is data. So the user may use various protocols to, uh, to access the data on our gateway. This is including the cloud-based services. Uh, the user may request direct connection to their existing uh, BMS system uh, based on the pro the backnet or BMS uh, Modbus protocol. Uh, they also have the option to use our uh, intuitive online dashboard to see the real-time data historic trends, as well as create some sort of the alert based on the predefined threshold. Okay, in the next few slides, I will focus to review four of our recent deployments. I would like to start with the condition monitoring at the ARTC facility. The main objective of this uh, deployment was to monitor the condition of electric motor installed on the overhead gantry. As it is installed 10 meters above the ground, there is no option to use a battery uh, because changing the battery is quite difficult. Also tapping to the main power, uh, power supply line to the motor was not permitted due to the safety concern. Uh, our solution, we use the 16 channel WPN gateway to charge the sensors on the electric, mat, uh, on the electric motor as well as three other uh, modules nearby on the nearby assets, including one press machine, as you can see in, uh, here. 
Uh, data, uh, data transmission for this uh, system was every second, and we used the MQTT protocol to communicate with the third party software. Uh, the main challenge about this deployment was the fact that the gantry uh, was able to move around the facility in the XY, y, XY plane. So we adopted a very nice and a smart beamforming uh, uh, technology to adopt the beams accordingly. The system is up and running for the last three months. Uh, Okay, the second the case study is a vibration monitoring at the Yukugawa. Uh, the objective of this uh, deployment was to gather high quality raw vibration data from the motor pumps using wireless sensor technology. Uh, the anal uh, analytics included two stage real time vibration severity level uh, detection, followed by in depth vibration spectrum analysis. Uh, the maximum speed of sampling that we used for this deployment was 1.3 kilohertz, and uh, it's about like 80,000 RPM. And the transmission rate of data was every five seconds. Uh, for this deployment, within three hours, we managed to gather more than 500 megs of data, which was sufficient to conduct very accurate FFT analysis. As of now, our sensors can just support up to 5.3 kilohertz of the uh, vibration sampling plus every second transmission of data. Uh, we have the third case study, which was uh, with our partner, uh, Schneider Electric. So the main objective of this deployment was to showcase integration to the existing VMS system using the Modbus protocol. Uh, there was two challenges for this project. Uh, as you can see in the photo uh, on the right-hand side top, uh, the sense module number one was partially blocked by the pop, uh, pipe in front of it. So uh, we used the ceiling as a reflector to bounce off the RF and charge the module one. Also for the sense number two, as you can see, it was placed on the water dispenser unit and it was blocked time to time by the staff walking around. So to address this issue also, we tried to allocate 20, uh, our algorithms, uh, try, uh, try to allocate uh, more than 25% time of charge to sense, number, uh, sense module number two compared to the number one. The system was deployed in two, uh, December 2019. It's up and running and we showcase that we can easily push the data to the existing BMS system. Uh, the fourth and the last, uh, but not the last uh, deployment that we had, it was uh, with Inter Offshore uh, company. It's a, a small SME within the oil and gas industry. So the objective of deployment was to detect any abnormality over the boring, uh, pipe boring machine. Uh, we used the vibration RMS to detect the, to, uh, to track the performance of machines and also create once the threshold, was, a predefined threshold was hit. Uh, the main challenge here was to define what, the right threshold. To do so, we create a series of the controlled faults over the machines, like loosening the bolts and measuring the vibration trend and figure out the thresholds. Uh, the whole process to deploy here, it took like a, less than a day to be completed uh, and delivered. The range of the wireless power transfer in this deployment was between 10 to 15 meters with semi line of uh, sight. Okay, here uh, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation by saying that the transfer for is next revolution of power connectivity. So don't lose the time and hop on. Thank you, Dr. Riza and Ashish for the interesting presentation. Now we'll hand over to Lina, who's head of operations at Transfer5 to moderate the Q&A session. Uh, you can submit all your, Q &A, uh, your questions at the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So keep the questions coming in. So now over to you, uh, Lina. Thanks, Colleen. Yep. Uh, we'll be taking uh, questions from the floor. I uh, see the questions are uh, coming in. Uh, first, uh, maybe you can address uh, Terence Cole's um, question. Uh, how, does, uh, how well does the technology work in multi-floor indoor environments and would walls and structures you know, cause much uh, attenuation? And if so, by how much? Uh, Ashish. Sure. Yeah, so, so basically our, our 
I mean, our system basically does go across uh, multiple flaws when it comes to wireless data, uh, which is quite exciting, actually. Our wireless data systems um, is, uh, you know, last for more than five years at five seconds, um, five seconds type of uh, interval of data transmission. And it's, it's actually something that you can definitely check out for sure when you want to do multi-floor type environments, indoor, uh, multi-room perspective. But that, I would say, is also a very different um, approach when it comes to power, a wireless power network, reliability and quality, a robust uh, distribution of power. We're looking at room by room basis, uh, but a 25 meter range, which is uh, without, I mean, with, even with obstacles in a way, as I think Dr. Reza was able to show within the case studies, we have algorithms in place to be able to find the best path to get to the actual targets. So it really depends on your cost structure, your business, um, your application, what you're looking for in the end of the day. Uh, but in the end of the day, it's, it's in both are possible in that perspective. And in terms of cost wise, yeah, I mean, our, our systems range from about you know, 200 USD all the way down to you know, 3000 USD. So it really depends again, a lot on your business, what you're looking for, the application ROI. And that, those are the things we want to be able to focus on because in the end of the day, uh, we, can, we have a system that you know, provides a good turnkey suite for uh, use cases, different use cases. So let us know in that perspective and we will be able to assist you on that. Yep, um, yeah, the next question from Gary Lee. Uh, how do you manage the EME issue within a system? I mean, that would refer to Reza, Dr. Reza. Yeah, uh, yeah. in terms of the transmission and uh, regulatory aspects, we follow the FCC protocols in terms of the safety and managing the interference. Uh, for data and wireless power transmission, also we, do, we use two different channels, which they are substantially separate uh, over the frequency spectrum, and we don't experience any sort of the interference as of now. Okay, thanks, Reza. Um, and one more question from Lin Kim Cheong. Um, can the sensor be placed on the underground pipe, 10 meters below ground, um, for pipe location detection? on the ground level, uh, also maintenance free for operation. In terms of being maintenance free, yeah, definitely we are maintenance free, but in terms of deployment uh, below the ground, we haven't tried uh, this one yet. So, but this is a possibility that we want to also try uh, if there is a use case, uh, but we can do some background search and see what's the attenuation over 10 meters of the ground. Uh, penetrating to the ground. Okay. Um, next question from uh, Chan Hong Ping. Uh, what's the frequency that's being used for RF wireless power transfer? Okay, our system is currently uh, software configurable. We can just select any frequency band within 816.8 megahertz, which is the European ISM band, and 915 megahertz, which is the uh, American uh, FCC approved ISM band. So different on the, the diff based on the different market, we need to decide which one to use and comply with their regulation. Okay, one question from Onel Lopez. Um, we'd like to know uh, how much greater is the system cost, cost considering also power consumption with respecting competing technologies, that means our competitors. Yeah, I think I think the big thing is um, you know our 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 gateways use between 60, 60 watts to seventy watts worth of power. So in the end of the day, the the power usage is very low. Uh, it's pretty much a rounding error within the industry or a building. Uh, cost comparisons. I mean, these things we need to know. Obviously, the application, what you're using for ROI. Um, in general, uh, when it comes to scalability, and you want to scale your sensor solution and also at the same time maintain data. There's really no cost comparison to you know wireless power network because you're replacing cables. Cables are expensive, um, but if you are looking at just long distance and being able to discover a large area for monitoring purposes and being able to just understand over time uh, long-term monitoring, then definitely you know there are uh, alternatives, and we can look into the um, and, and that's what we also provide to be honest in terms of the wireless data side, but that would be a different cost structure. But yeah, so I think um, cost-wise, uh, what's nice is that we're competitive in that perspective. Uh, we definitely, you know, I think definitely take down our email addresses and, and we'll love to talk about that more as well. 
Yep. Uh, next from uh, Will Sung. Uh, he wants to know, does uh, technology cover over large outdoor areas? Uh, and does it work in wet weather, fog, and under the hot sun? OK, in terms of the enclosure, we are uh, comply with the IP65, 66, and 67 based on the different uh, hardware that we have. So in terms of fog or rain, it's no, uh, no issue. So as you, uh, as you know that your cell phone also works within the rainy days. It's not a big deal. Uh, we, are not over we are not operating at the high, very high frequency. We are just about the one gigahertz. And there is no, there is no issue with that one. Okay. Um, there's one uh, uh, question is uh, related to efficiency. Maybe you can uh, just touch on that. What's the efficiency of wireless power transfer and what voltage and power can it provide on the receiver end? Okay, sure. So in terms of the efficiency is really a function of the distance. Uh, also, I want to compare here Wi-Fi data system that we are using now versus the cable LAN. So it's nothing, it's nothing very straightforward to compare the LAN versus the Wi-Fi. Is still the LAN is much cheaper, much more reliable, but every day we use the Wi-Fi to connect to get our phone connected to the internet. So it's about more convenience and the cost of deployment rather than just the efficiency. But our efficiency for the rectifier itself, RF to DC, it can be as high as 60% over, over the input range of minus 5 dBm up to 5 dBm plus. In terms of the RF to RF, it depends on how many antennas we are allowed to use and the environment and surrounding. Yeah, I mean, just in the application point of view as well, um, so one thing that, that we have uh, you know, spent a lot of time on is the, the commercial deployability of these systems and getting it to work in terms of data rates and so on. So for example, uh, we can go up to five hertz worth of data rate, which is basically you know, fast data rates, 1.3 uh, kilohertz of sampling rates. So, uh, so these are the things in which I think uh, uh, in the end of the day, it's all about ROI. Uh, efficiency is something that, yeah, we, we love to talk about a lot as well. It's quite exciting. In the end of the day, it's, it's about the application and the commercial viability. Um, those are the things which we uh, have focused on for the past you know, two to three years to really be able to deploy the system that's reliable, robust, and, and high quality into the data. Um, efficiency, we can focus on that. But again, that's, uh, in the end of the day, it's all about the, the, the ROI aspects as well. Yep. Um, I think uh, Nadas has a question on um, power. Uh, would the power be split between receiver units, uh, let's say if it's an indoor environment? Okay, sure. So we have the a smart charging mechanism which decides how long and when each of the individual receivers should be charged. Also, our beamforming solution supports some uh, technology called beam split, which at the same time can charge two different directions. So all comes to the optimization problem that we, uh, our system is just solving real time based on the environment feedback. Okay, and one question by Chan Hong Ping. Uh, I want to know uh, which part of FCC uh, do we comply, part 18 and any other standards which we will comply? Okay, in terms of the compliances, uh, we haven't yet received any certification, but we designed everything to be comp complied with part A18. Uh, one question from Onel, uh, how small is the form factor um, for the uh, products? Basically the sensor. Uh, yeah, one, we can uh, show the sensor to you. Yeah. This is the sensor, the size. This is my phone. So, as you can see, it's like a half size of one third of the phone size. So we have the wireless power version as well here. It's quite a small. So I can say it's about a, a, a 7 cm by 5 cm max. And a question uh, from the spec sheet, okay. uh, definitely we share the uh, spec sheet with the those interested. So you can see all the details, the dimensions about the product. Yeah. There's a question from Ken. Um, what's the maximum power possible with a technology and what is the limitation? Is it hardware or is it safety? Okay, so it depends on the range. So we are talking about like a, uh, for a short range, we managed to power up the gaming mouse 
consuming continuous of more than 100 milliwatt. For the longer range, up to 25 meter, we are currently charging sensors with the rate of more than 5 milliwatt continuously. So again, in terms of the limitation to the power is just safety. If we have the environment which is remote, no human being around, we can pump the energy, we can use the more directional antenna and improve the uh, efficiency of RF to RF transmission. Because uh, as I mentioned, our RF to DC conversion is one of the best in the market with more than 60% efficiency over the very ra uh, wide range of operation. Okay, one question from Ong Chun Lian. Uh, what is the output voltage and current? The sensor. So the, I think I, I discussed about the power. So if I give the voltage range, so you can just convert, you can figure out the current. So uh, we have the system, which is configurable in terms of the output power. So you can set anything between 1.8 volt up to 5.2 volt. Okay, um, one question from Gary Lee. Um, our tech uh, use uh, edge server and ARM processor. Can you briefly explain what has been deployed and these applications or how is it used? Sure. So for example, the sense module that I mentioned, we have uh, six sensor on board. So we need a powerful MCU to communicate with these sensors and collect data from them and prepare the data to be transferred through the BLE module. So why powerful uh, MCU probably? So we are dealing with a very good quality data measurement. Uh, for example, for the sensor, for the vibration sensor, we are talking about 5.3 kilohertz of sampling, more than 9,000 samples per X, Y, Z access. So to handle this uh, massive uh, data point per each measurement, we need to have a very powerful MCU. A question from Utah, son. Um, where is our um, target uh, countries, I guess, for or on the market for us? Hi, um, Utah. Thanks for the question. Uh, basically, our target countries would be um, you know, Southeast Asia, Europe, and America. Uh, one area that we're looking into, and we're working with a lot of companies, is in Japan. Um, at the moment, obviously in Japan, um, Arib is going through a, a change in terms of regulation. So we're just waiting for those changes to be able to uh, uh, target Japan as well. And a question from Charles Ho. Um, are we working on applications that require power scaling? Um, sorry, just clarify. So there's like, like higher power levels. Um, so at the moment, we are focused on our, our system is all you know within the uh, we're just focused on systems that are safe and, and kind of focus on deploying within the industrial environments. Higher power levels, really, it's it's more about uh, specific application and product areas which are identified. If you think it's something that uh, you know makes sense on the road, yes, we will work on it. But uh, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not too sure what you mean by power scaling. Yeah, maybe Charles, if you could clarify in the um, Q&A box. Um, let me see if there's a response. Oh, high power, yeah. Okay, in terms of scaling to, to high power applications. Yeah, uh, the possibility is there, but uh, so far what we tried, we, you know, there are tons of research uh, going around the world on implementing radio frequency. We try to focus on one particular domain to create a some proper product around this wireless power transfer technology. So there's a possibility to increase, as I mentioned, if the safety concern is not the uh, issue, for example, we are talking about the remote areas. Yeah, we can use the more powerful amplifiers as well as more directional antennas to boost the power level and the range of operation. So yeah, that's a possibility. Um, one question from Chan Hongping. Uh, what's the max ER, EIRP power uh, in watts of your RF uh, wireless power transfer long distance transmission? Okay, so uh, 30 watt for the 16 channel, which has the most number of the antenna, it's 30 watt per meter square at 1.5 meter. 
which is in compliance with the part 18 in terms of the human safety. I can sense the excitement of the audience from the questions that are coming in. So that's great participation. Um, do we have further questions? You can type your questions at the bottom of your Zoom screen onto the uh, Q&A icon. Yeah, I think there's more uh, question coming. Uh, I know over to you. Yep, uh, question from um, on Chun Lian. Uh, any limit from regulatory on power and transmission, uh, as in the power levels, right? Yeah, uh, it's FCC Part eighty. So also Part one and two for the human safety. We just follow that one. All right, we have come to the end of our technology sharing session. Hope we have all enjoyed this session. And thank you once again for being with us and for your very active participation. We look forward to seeing you in other webinars organized by IPI. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone.